I chose this because of uh, reminiscing a little bit. When you hit a milestone like 70, uh, it's amazing. Uh, do I feel like 70? I don't know what 70 is supposed to feel like. Um, I try to keep an active life. I'm on my roof, roofing a roof now at 70, and um, I enjoy doing that. I tell my wife I'll get it done, but not as fast as I used to get it done. But uh, so I was really reminiscing. I was reminiscing about being called into the ministry. So I'm going to be going through that a little bit today. As, as I said, a little bit different ministry and uh, also about being called to preach and what God does uh, in our lives. <clears throat> you can turn with me, please, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 12 to 14. We'll be getting through that in a moment. I decided to preach this message because of my 38 years in the ministry. My first church was in Yonkers, New York. In 1980, in September, I'll never forget that when I came there. But before that, I became a uh, missionary school teacher in 1973. And in 1974, I was ordained. And I was the assistant pastor and music director at Maranatha Baptist Church in Okinawa, Japan. Along the way, I have learned many lessons some with great difficulty, but all these lessons were for a reason. And as I said, I just celebrated a huge milestone two days ago. So hence the reason for my reminiscing. My dad was a school teacher and he received his master's degree from Columbia University in New York City. And he always placed a premium on education. And so of course, Ken, myself, and our sister Nancy uh, all graduated college and went on to uh, postgraduate degrees as well. I received my BA degree from Houston Baptist University in 1971 and my Master's of Theology from Bethany Theological Seminary in Dothan, Alabama in 1991 and my Doctor of Theology from Bethany in 1993. When I moved to California in 1993 to marry Charlene because my wife died in 1991, uh, Patty, uh, breast cancer, and uh, remarried to Charlene in 1993. I took a position with the Elk Grove Unified School District, and I had to take another 20 college courses to get up to snuff with teaching. Reason being, in education, there's two ways to move up, uh, and one is how many years you teach, and the other is how many more college degrees that you have. Because I went to a Bible seminary, they did not accept my education for teaching purposes. So starting teaching, I started in year one and A, which means it was just like at a school, at a college. And so the lady at the state apologized profusely, and I said, it's not your fault, don't worry about it. And I set to take a lot of college courses in education, and that's what I did. I say this not to boast. But I say this to let you know that I have learned more from experience than from any classroom that I took. And that is very important. Um, I majored in history and I taught in the Elk Grove Unified School District for 16 years. I, I first started teaching at a college uh, in Englewood, New Jersey. But uh, then I went into the ministry and my call there. Uh, my life has been very varied. You know that I love baseball. I was a baseball player. I was drafted by the Montreux Expos in 1971 out of college. Uh, I did not play professional baseball because there were a couple important things happening. Number one, I was getting married to Patty the same week I was supposed to report to spring training in Winter Haven, Florida. Number two, um, I had a half a year of college to go. Number three, the Vietnam War was raging and uh, my lottery number was number 60. They were already up to 162 or something like that. And so uh, if I lost my school exemption, I'd probably be over there in Vietnam. But I didn't realize it, but I did fail my physical because of asthma uh, later on. But those three reasons. So when I was drafted, I had some very good experiences. The fellow who wanted to, uh, to sign me, his name was Red Murph. 
Uh, Murph uh, was a uh, past professional ball player, pitcher, and uh, he also was a scout for the Braves, the Mets. Matter of, fi- matter of fact, he signed Nolan Ryan, if you know anything about baseball. Uh, so he signed some other ones that were tremendous. And uh, Murph had a, a, a uh, liking of my baseball skills, and he told me that. Matter of fact, it, it meant a lot to me. I was playing down in the border of Texas uh, at Pan American University, and uh, when I grounded out the first, he, the first time I met him, he, he yelled at me, he said, hey, Mahood, come over here. And so he said, I'm Red Murph from the Montreux Expos, which are now the Washington Nationals. And he said to me, he said, just keep doing what you're doing. He says, I'm going to take you. He said, you have the best swing I've ever seen in baseball. And has stuck with me a long time. But God had other plans. So I've had a varied life, uh, different experiences here. But uh, as we read here, number one, I thank the Lord that he called me to preach. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 12 to 14, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. No matter how much education, no matter how much fame, no matter what a position a person may have, even the position that Paul had, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was rated as the second smartest person in Israel at the time. He declared how thankful he was for the Lord putting him into the ministry. Pastoring is not a job, but a calling. Paul knew this on the road to Damascus. The call was so certain that he never questioned his call. And so when I look at my entrance into full-time service, at the time I was teaching in the Englewood, New Jersey school district, And I thought I had my future all figured out for me. I was doing that, and I already passed on baseball, but I was playing semi-pro baseball at the time, having a good time as that as well. Uh, Trisha, my firstborn, she was just born. And I went to an evening service at our church. We had a very small church, Englewood Baptist Temple. There was a missionary there who was showing a film on Africa. I sat in the back of the church that evening like all good Baptists do. (laughs) During that film, God spoke to me in a way which he never did before. I made no public decision. To this day, I still have not come forward for full-time service. But my private call was as clear as day. At that time, I just finished my first year teaching and was moving up to a new school teaching PE and coaching my love baseball. As I said, I was also playing uh, semi-pro baseball in a well-respected metropolitan league. And for any baseball junkies out there, one of the guys that I batted against was Jim Bouton of the 1961 championship Yankees. And I lined an RBI single off of him, which was always in my memory, but uh, had a lot of things that I I loved to do during that time. Also, my dad uh, had a landscaping business, and I was going to take that over as well. So I had everything set, but the call changed all of that. And I remember as I sat there and I felt God calling me into his service, I went home and my late wife Patty was there, because our daughter was very young at the time. We didn't have any nursery at the church, especially for the evening service. And she asked how the service was, and I told her about what happened in my life. And when I told her about going into full-time service, I said, what do you think about that? And she said these words, fantastic, when do we go? That is very important when you have a willing wife. 
when you're called in the ministry. Because there's some ladies that are not willing to do that when, when a man is called into service. And so what we did, we just bought a brand new car, sold it, had a huge garage sale. We were renting our, uh, uh, our aunt's house, and uh, we, we were able to do that. I made a phone call to my new principal. Actually, my dad taught him when he was younger. And I said, I'm going to Okinawa to teach at Okinawa Christian School. And he said, Ron, what do you want to go to the rock for? It's not nice beaches in Okinawa. It's all rocky and everything. And he says, you sure you want to do this, you know? And I said, yes, I, I need to do this. He said, okay, write me out a letter of resignation. And I did that. John chapter 15 and verse 16. John chapter 15 and verse 16. I've always felt that in my life it is very important to do what God wants you to do. And if he calls you, you need to do it. No excuses whatsoever. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, it states, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. God calls and we need to answer that call. Every missionary, every pastor, every evangelist has a call of how God called them into the ministry. If they don't have a call, they shouldn't go into the ministry. That's plain and simple. Go with me please to Acts chapter 20. <coughs> Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. This is what Paul says here, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The goal of a pastor has to be faithfulness to his people. That is the most important thing because God gives you a congregation and you have to be available for their needs and their times and this is the most important thing for a pastor. Go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And in Hebrews 13, we're going to look at verse 17. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 and verse 17. And it says here, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. The goal of the church people is not to be a burden to the pastor. It is very important. And it was interesting, I heard the story about uh, Richard DeHaan, the, uh, the, the founder of the Radio Bible Class, the devotional that we get, of course. <coughs> and he was actually preaching, or M.R. De, MR DeHaan, he, he's the, the, the older gentleman. And he was preaching, he had a Bible, and he was preaching in Highland Park Baptist Church. And the people in the balcony could see him, and his Bible was so brittle, he would turn it with two pages. And uh, he was quite a man of God. And after he passed away, they asked his son, um, what was the hardest thing for your dad? He says, being a pastor because of the people in the church. No one would ever think that about M.R. DeHaan, but that's exactly what happened in his life. Number two, pastors need to be an example to the people. First Peter chapter five, first Peter chapter five, and verses one to four. And Peter writes here, the elders who are among you I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. 
nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. There's a couple things that I noticed in this. In verse 2 it says, serve willingly, not by compulsion <coughs> and money is not your reason for service. This goes to the idea of motivation. Life always comes down to attitude. You can be forced to do things or have money a motivating factor, but the heart of service is the most important ingredient for the pastor. If he doesn't have a servant's heart, he shouldn't be a pastor. That is the most important thing. The second thing says shepherding. After motivation comes the exhortation to shepherd with the primary idea of feeding that is teaching the word of God. Teaching. Every pastor must be able to teach. Yes, there's a little difference between teaching and preaching. We understand that. And sometimes I bridge the difference. Uh, you know, I might get all excited in teaching a Sunday school lesson and I go into the preaching mode. Likewise, sometimes when I have to explain things, I need to go into the teaching mode uh, during Sunday morning service as well. Very important. Philippians 3.17. This is a scary verse, especially for pastors. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Yes, for all Christians, but especially for pastors. In chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Brethren, join in following my example. That's what Paul is saying. And know those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Us for a pattern. What a scary thought. But as John MacArthur stated, since all believers are imperfect, they need examples of less imperfect people who know how to deal with imperfection and who can model the process of pursuing the goal of Christ-likeness. That's a great statement that he had. Paul was that model. So should every pastor strive to be a model. And that's what Dr. MacArthur said right there. And I agree with that 100%. When you realize your imperfections, and you realize your, your problems in your life, but yet you are called to be a pastor, to be an example to others. That is a scary thought. Very difficult. It's not always about ability, but more about willingness. That willing attitude allows us countless opportunities to model humility, kindness, gentleness, holiness, and thankfulness. That is the most important thing. Go with me, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 7. Judges, chapter 7. Although I preached on him before, I'm just going to mention just a few things about Gideon here. Judges, chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 2 first. Chapter 7 and verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. And so Gideon assembled this mighty multitude of people to go up against the Midianites. But God said it's too many, because Israel say, look what we have done. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of all whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomsoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Talk about God's calling, huh? Verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by 300 men. Who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, everyone to his own place. Wow. 
This is amazing. From thousands of people down to 300. But then in verse 9, it happened on that same night that the Lord said to them, Arise, go down against the camp, for I, the Lord, have delivered it into your hand. I think this is really important. Anything good in ministry is because of God, not because of me and not because of you. It's because of God. We are prone to be proud of ourselves and our accomplishments. If we are to have any praise, then it's because the Lord has given us his honor. And I love what they called out with Gideon. And the cry was, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And so we know, of course, that God lifted up Gideon, but of course the Lord was first lifted up. James chapter 1 and verse 19. James chapter 1 and verse 19. As I'm going through this whole thing, things I have learned about the ministry. Number one is our example is every bit as important as our words. Number two, anything good in ministry is because of God. And number three is this. Learn something from every criticism. There is usually some truth contained in it. James chapter 1 and verse 19. And this is important because I was trying to make a list of things that I learned in the ministry, and this is one of them. And in chapter 1 and verse 19, it states, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Even if someone's criticism is completely off, there is usually something that you can learn by it. One time, someone criticized me for being so busy that when they tried to talk with me, they felt that I wasn't paying attention to them. And actually the lady told me that to my face. She says, you're not paying attention to me. From that point forward, no matter how busy I am or how many people need to speak to me, I try to give my undivided attention to them. Now I say, I try. Sometimes you fail, but it's very important that you do that. And so I learned from that lesson. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verses 1 to 4. Matthew chapter 23 and verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus spoke to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. For they bind heavy burdens to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move uh, them with one of their little fingers. <coughs> <coughs> Preach every message to yourself. That's what I've learned. You are not a righteous judge that stands by and give advice. You are there to preach God's word that spoke to your heart first, and then you prepare the message. For when I prepare these messages, first God speaks to my heart. The pulpit is not your soapbox but a place where you need to be used by the Holy Spirit to touch the lives of people. An example of this, I've heard people visit our church and thought I prepared the message just for them. In reality, it was the Holy Spirit that enabled me to prepare that message for those to hear that day, and sometimes the message is prepared and written up a month previously. But it's the Holy Spirit. Preach every message to yourself. Number five, Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and verses 37 to 40. In verse 37, now Barnabas, in Acts 15, now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, 
who wrote Mark in the Bible. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them at Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed being commanded by the, uh, commended by the brethren to the grace of God. I've learned this. Disagreement is not disloyalty. Don't be offended when people disagree with you, especially other leaders of the church. I've realized that I don't have all the answers. That's why we have board meetings and business meetings so that we can get other ideas and opinions. The church board is not supposed to be a body of yes men to the pastor's desires. The key to a good ministry is unity of the body, and that's the most important thing. So disagreement is not disloyalty. Number six, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. Chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I've learned this. Sometimes you have to take the high road. When it's time to apologize, by all means apologize. But sometimes you must apologize taking the high road when it isn't even your fault. Why? Because the person perceived that you did something wrong, even though you didn't. And if they perceive that you have hurt them, you need to go to them and apologize and never start and apologize if I offended you, because you did offend them. I have apologized from the pulpit a few times in my ministry, and I make no excuses about it. If you do something wrong, you stand up and be a man or be a woman. If you offend someone and you apologize and don't give any other reasons, you just say, I am sorry, I offended you, I will not let it happen again. That is the most important thing that I have learned in my ministry. Take the high road. Number seven, 1 Timothy chapter three. 1 Timothy chapter three. I'm trying to back all these up with scriptures so that you can see where I'm coming from here. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? I've learned this. Don't bring church problems home to your wife and family. The church is a responsibility but my family is 24 seven, period. If you can't be a good husband and a father, how can you be a good pastor? Many pastors get burned out because when a church problem is happening, they cannot separate it from their family life. Pray about the situation, give it over to the Lord and try the best you can solve it, but don't let it overcome you 24 hours a day. You have to make sure that you are faithful to your family. When I was going before a mission board at Baptist International Missions in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I didn't even tell you the rest of the story. From Okinawa, I came back, felt the call to go to mainland Japan, and then we were on deputation for two and a half years, then we went to Japan as a missionary there in uh, uh, Megumi Baptist Kyokai, which is uh, Grace Baptist Church. And um, when I sat before the board and my wife and myself before the board, they asked me this loaded question. How would you answer this one? What is more important to you, your family or your ministry? 
I said, my family. Ministry has changed, but my, families don't. my family doesn't. I guess they liked it because I was a missionary. <laughs> I was accepted. But I believe that with my whole heart. <clears throat> John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. I was trying to reminisce some of the stories of past. I remember when I first became a pastor and hardly had any stories. I was getting the Sword of the Lord newspaper at the time, and Jack Hiles was writing in it, and he gave a couple of good examples, and in the bottom he said, Hey, pastors, don't use my example. Get your own examples. John chapter 5 and verse 39. In, in John 5, 39, it says, But if it is of God, who, can, uh, who cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found? Oh, sorry about that. I also learned that people follow in their Bibles and see if I'm right or not. I've also learned that I make mistakes. But I make my mistakes on purpose. I'm kidding. Okay. Chapter 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think... You have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. I realize this. In every service, if you notice, I give the plan of salvation at every service. It might be the only time a visitor hears the plan of salvation. Don't worry if it seems redundant to you church people. Remember, they heard the plan of salvation to get saved as well, all of you. Give it clearly, understandably, and precisely. That you are a sinner, that you're sorry for your sins, that your works cannot save you, that Christ died for you on the cross, and then you have to believe that you need to trust him and invite him into your heart, the plan of salvation. My first funeral in Yonkers, New York, and my first church in, uh, when I took the church in 1980, I think it was the next year, because I took it in September. My first funeral uh, was of one of our faithful uh, church people. Matter of fact, uh, she was getting ready for a prayer meeting. She lived with uh, two of her daughters that were identical twins, and she was probably just in her 80s. And uh, she, was just, she just got dressed, and all of a sudden, she leaned back on her bed and she died, getting ready for prayer meeting. And so the twins, uh, you know, called me up, went over to the house after prayer meeting and so forth. We talked about things. And so it was a large funeral. We were at a funeral home. And um, the other daughter who lived in Pennsylvania came to me and said, I heard that you're going to give an invitation at this funeral. And I said, yes, I am. She says, I forbid it. Do not. You know what I told her? I said, find another preacher. And I started walking out of the door. I said, you don't tell me what to say or do. Preach that message that day on that funeral, and three people accepted Christ as Savior. She came to me after the service. She apologized. She said, I thought they would be slobbering on my mom's uh, casket. I said, even if they were, your mom would have loved it. So I have decided I'll always give the plan of salvation. That's something that I have learned at every service. Number nine, Second Timothy, and I'll try to get the right verse this time. Second Timothy, chapter four and verse two. Second Timothy, chapter four and verse two, it says, <coughs> in verse two, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience, and that's not what I want. That's 1 Timothy. And I got it wrong again. What do you want? I just turned 70. Give me a break, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Here it is. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. I've learned this. Try to teach one new thing to the most learned church person. Because I believe this. If I can teach one new thing to the most mature Christian, 
then other people will learn something in my message. A pastor needs to feed his flock, and they do that by studying and simplifying the point of Scripture. All right, and then Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16. And in Daniel 6, 16, it says this. So the king gave the command. This is the right verse. And they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Daniel wasn't that sure. But here, Darius, the Mede, the king there at that time, he was sure that the God of Daniel would deliver him. And so this is what I've learned from that Bible verse. Be relevant today and make practical solutions to today's problems. You'll probably never be cast into a den of lions, but you may be asked to compromise your testimony. The reason why Daniel was going into that lion's den was because he would not compromise. All he had to do before he prayed to his God was to close his shutters but he did not close his shutters because he never closed his shutters before and he was going to be faithful to his God. And so the practical lesson is this, that you need to make it down to the people's lives and show them what is relevant today. Daniel would not compromise. That's what we learned from that lion's den experience. How to be a Christian on social media how to be a testimony at work. How to be a testimony at my school. <coughs> how to show the joy of the Lord in my life, even under difficult circumstances. These are some of the things that I have learned in my 38 years as pastor. I started pastoring in 1980. But I also learned, now you might say, but it's 2019, Remember, I lost my, my wife, and I didn't pastor for a year. <clears throat> but I also learned other things by being a Christian school teacher, a missionary in Japan to a vastly different culture. Before that, I learned to be faithful in my attendance in church, how to give systematically to the Lord, how to put him first in my life, how to raise a Christian family, how to pray more, how to study the Word of God, and how to allow the Lord to work in my life. I just want to give you some facts from World Impact Organization about pastors. Alarming facts. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry permanently every year. 1,500. 4,000 new churches start every year in America. But wait, 7,000 churches close their doors every year. 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce. 70% of pastors continually battle depression. I'm too dumb for that. I don't get depressed. <laughs> Something happens bad, it's like, oh, that's terrible. Okay, what are we doing next? 80% <laughs> of pastors and 85% of their spouses feel discouraged in their roles. 70% of pastors do not have a close friend, confidant, or mentor. 40% of pastors have an extramarital affair since entering the ministry. 80% of seminary graduates who enter the ministry will leave it within five years. 90% of pastors say their training was inadequate for the ministry. And 90% of pastors said the hardest thing about ministry is uncooperative people. And, and here's, here's the big one. Only 50% of pastors felt called of God into the ministry three years later. 
So maybe it was an emotion, and when they look back, they said, no, I never was really call of God. So let me end this message here. <sighs> Finally, what I learned is I don't worry about statistics when dealing with my own ministry. I try to be sensitive to what God wants me to do. I have been through church splits, church splinters, disgruntled members, blame for not having the church grow quicker, not being a good teacher, not being a good preacher, not being loving enough, not being dedicated enough, being too authoritative, being too overbearing, and many other things that can be added to the long list. And I gotta tell you this, when I was dating my late wife, her stepfather hated me with a passion. And he wrote a list, 30 reasons why I hate Ron Mahood. <laughs> Amazing. I told my fellow teachers that, and you'll chuckle at this, Wendy. And when they celebrated my birthday, we would celebrate everybody's birthday, they gave me a, a, a plaque, and it was 30 reasons why we love Ron Mahood. <laughs> When I came into the ministry, I was too young. Now people say I'm too old, and they ask, when are you going to retire? <laughs> to answer their question, and here it is, I leave it up to the Lord to guide me and direct me. I learned that you can't please everyone, but you must please the Lord. Amen. That is the most important thing. Let's bow our heads, please, and close our eyes just for a moment different type of message today. I realize that, but something that the Lord placed in my heart as I was reminiscing. But I will ask if you are here and you've never accepted Christ as Savior and you'd like to make that commitment today, just raise your hand, please, and we'll pray for you. And let me just say this to you folks. The most important thing that you can do in your life is to be dedicated to Jesus Christ. That's the number one thing. Heavenly Father, as we have this invitation, I want to thank you personally. Number one, for my salvation. Number two, that you saw fit to use me in the ministry. Number three, that you brought me here to Vintage Park Community Church. And I know that my life is in your hands and trying to do your will. That is the most important thing. Thank you for teaching me these lessons. And Father, as we all reminisce about our Christian life, we pray also that we can be honest and we can see how you, we can be used of you, even in whatever aspect of ministry we do. Bless now, Father, this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting with verse 9 and concluding with the last verse of the chapter 14, and it says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise. He still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright. Words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of the scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd, and further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books. There is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or or evil. May the Lord add his blessing to the word of God. Bow with me for prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, and we thank you for your marvelous salvation that we have only through the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and we pray, Lord, that you will guide and direct us. We pray that you'll bless the special music. 
We also pray that you bless the preaching of the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that we can call upon you. We thank you, Lord, that you have us in the palm of your hand. And we thank you, Lord, for the marvelous salvation that we can have, but not just salvation, but dedication to give our lives over to your service. So we pray, Lord, that you'll bless the rest of the service now. In Jesus' name, amen. So Shana was supposed to sing this morning.